Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Visa Office. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to apply for a visa to Australia, please. Certainly, sir. I'll just get a form, and then I'll need to take some details down. Okay, here we go. Right. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Okamura. Kelly Okamura. And how do you spell that, please? K E double L. No, your family name, please. Oh, sorry. It's O K A M U R A. O K A M U R A. And your address? Apartment one o six Kingston Street, Hawaii. Kingston Street, Hawaii. Yes, that's correct. So you're an American? Actually, I was born in Japan, but moved to Hawaii six years ago. And can I have your age, please, Mr. Okamura? I'm thirty-two. And are you married? Yes, I am. My wife's Chinese. As the conversation continues, answer questions six to ten. Do you have any relatives living in Australia? I used to have an uncle. But he died several years ago. Now there's only my sister-in-law and my wife's cousin. So the purpose of your trip is to visit your wife's relatives. Am I correct? Well, not exactly. Mainly because I have my own trading company and I will be looking for business opportunities. Although I do want to do some travelling as well, you know, see some of the sights, that sort of thing. Although I don't intend to work in Australia. And your wife, what will she be doing? She'll be studying English. She wants a student visa. And how long do you plan to stay? About one year, I guess. Well, I'm afraid a standard tourist visa is only valid for thirty days. Although in your case, we can issue you with a business visa. Business visas last for six months, but you will be able to renew it. We can give your wife a twelve-month visa, though. Six months is okay. So what do I need to do now? Come along to the office any time during weekdays, but it must be office hours. We close at five thirty. And bring along two passport-size photos and your passport, of course. Your wife will also need two photos. So that's four passport-size photos in total. Okay, thank you for your help. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section one. Listen to the first part of the talk carefully, and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Keep them out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in, which means you can enjoy more peace of mind. And isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, day and night. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and locks on the house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar, the first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave your windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution. But a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole. Install one in the front door. If you have one, 
make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of the reach of your children, keep a stepladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if that glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer, jewelry, etc., where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency to identify the stolen goods. Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information, such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. As the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes, or any garden tools should be put away. Preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation. Create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies. Buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn the volumes up too. Not enough to annoy the neighbors, just enough that a lurker at the window sill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbor to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbor to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house sit your home. If he's a relative or friend, he may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house sitters or house sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up every one. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. That is the end of section two. Section three. You will hear a tutor talking to a student about a case study. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi. Am I bothering you? Is it okay to see you now? Hi, Jack. No bother. Please come in. As you're a tutor this year, it's my responsibility to oversee your assignments. Now, where are my notes? Oh yes, here they are. Okay. I see that we were going to look at your case study on the challenges of urban planning in the twenty-first century and how to make it as green as possible. How's it all going? Actually, I'm pretty happy with it. Can I talk you through it to make sure I'm on the right track? Of course, please do. 
I'll stop you if I have any questions. Okay. Well, I started by giving an overview of what green urban planning has been up until now. Firstly, there's the idea of a green belt. This is the one that everyone's heard of. But I found that while it was successful for a short time and in limited cases, it grossly oversimplified things. Well, that's a good and practical start. Um, what else did you look at? I hope that you also considered the idea of decentralization. Yes, that was really interesting, as although there were no objections to it, and it looked good on paper, it just didn't work in practice. Yes, a conundrum indeed. However, I think you'll find that there are many fads that come and go in this area. It isn't the first, and it won't be the last to simply disappear off the face of the planet. Well, this is all very good so far. What did you look at next? I then researched the 1960s fad of building new towns on new sites, but I found that although there are isolated cases of success, they tended to cost too much time and money to build. Keeping to that theme, have you considered the idea of brownfield sites? That is, sites that previously had another use being converted into residential areas. Like the idea of buildings that were once banks being turned into restaurants, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. No, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I'd say it's a pretty important option in most urban areas today. Even though there have been issues with safety, if the land were contaminated in any way, at least it tends to attract no objections from local residents. OK, thanks. I'll make sure I put that in. Anything else? Well, I'm not sure about this last one, but I thought the idea of pedestrianizing central areas was an interesting concept. Do you think it's valid here? Well, it's certainly not a bad idea. The only thing is that it would probably intensify the problem of congestion in inner city areas and would disrupt local residents' sleep if the construction work were to happen during the night. The use of loud excavators to repave the area would be inevitable. Yes, I take your point. But in some older cities, I think it's one of the few viable options. Well, as long as you state that, then it can definitely be included. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Okay, so that's my introduction to urban planning sorted. But now I come to the main part, which is the case study. It was really difficult to choose, as there are so many good examples. But in the end, I settle on Curitiba, which is the capital of the South Brazilian state of Paraná. Ah, yes, nice choice. How's the research coming along? Well, to be honest, I'm finding the amount of material a bit too much. There's such a diverse range of statistics that it makes it almost impossible to be selective. Well, tell me a bit more about what you discovered, and then we'll see if we can come up with a plan to tackle the problem. Well, it's fascinating. Local authorities managed to achieve so much since the 1960s, principally because, rather than waiting for central government initiatives, they chose a cohesive strategy where residents were consulted. Then they took their ideas and implemented them into local government planning to come up with a plan everybody was happy with. Aha! Uh -huh. A bottom-up approach. Do go on. Well, the transport system is a real example of the town's eco-friendly image. Even though they have one of the highest number of cars per person in the country, they also have the highest number of people using public transport. This is because poor and elderly residents are able to benefit from a social fare that allows them to use the system for less. This has led to low levels of pollution, which also encourages citizens to use bicycles more. Well, that's really impressive, Jack. Well done. But I do have some suggestions to help you with finalizing your case study. Please. If you're going to prove Curitiba's success, you need to refer to specifics. You mentioned pedestrian-only areas in your introduction. How about that? 
Yes, OK. And what about the amount of parking for all of those cars? I didn't come across that in my research, but I can look it up. Yeah, I think it's important. And what about considering where people live in relation to their place of work? If they live in the suburbs, how about mentioning how far they need to travel in order to get to work? And don't forget about their recycling strategy, including how easy it is and how much they recycle, making sure you include statistics to back it up. OK, got it. All in all, Jack, you've really done your homework, and I very much look forward to receiving your final draft. Thanks, Professor. You've been a great help. That is the end of Section 3. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk to economics students about how to make the most of their course. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Stanley University School of Economics. I will be one of your lecturers on the course, and my name is Professor Whitefield. Before the academic year really gets underway, I would like to take you through some of what you can expect and to give you some general course information. Firstly, you'll be attending lectures during which you will receive information about economics and the priorities that you will need to focus on. The lectures will provide you with information about the subject in a relatively condensed format. In addition, they should also provide a suitable framework for further study. Typically, this is also the first time that students get the chance to meet a researcher at the forefront of the discipline. Traditionally, lectures are seen as an essential part of the learning culture for higher education, in which undergraduate study is viewed as an induction into academic discipline and a way of viewing the world. However, although all I have said until now is true, Every year, undergraduate students experience problems with the techniques used in lectures. Being forewarned will hopefully help you with adjusting to these issues. The first problem is that there is little opportunity for the development of student understanding. That is, if you misunderstand something, there is no immediate opportunity to ask. Secondly, when newer teaching approaches are used, such as problem solving, learning outcomes are improved. However, these will still not replace the validity of listening and learning from an expert. Now, before you start despairing, there are several things that you can do in order to make the learning process and consequently your student life at the university easier. First and foremost, be prepared. You will be given a reading list. Don't just throw it away or forget about it. Make sure you leave enough time to go through all items on it. Once you've done that, an ideal thing to do would be to test yourself on the contents. Prepare a, a mini quiz while reading and go back to it before the lecture and just check you know the answers. Now, for most of you, this won't be the first time that you're studying economics, but you may have taken a gap year or had a, a period of time working. If this is so, and even if it isn't in fact, it always makes sense to go back and refresh your memory on those relevant theories you learned about before, as we'll definitely be referring to them. OK, there are just a, a couple more ideas I'd like to suggest before I'll take any questions you may have. 
We are lucky enough to be living in a digital age. So use resources like the web to do some extra background research. There's no shortage of information nowadays, but just be sure that you're using reliable resources. Finally, and this is an important one, make sure you discuss ideas with your peers. They're in the same boat as you are after all, and you'll probably find that it helps make your learning more memorable. All in all, take charge of your learning and you'll find that you succeed. Now, do you have any questions before we go on to the next? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.